The best way, they say, to foretell the future is to get involved with it. The best way to predict stuff that's going to happen is for you to participate. Say, for instance, something was going to happen on a day of next week. Let's just say Tuesday. <laughs> Ain't no good for you to sit around prophesying what's going to happen. You asking people what they going to do, what you going to do. During that retreat, um, I decided, you know what, I wanted to hear some preaching this weekend and I wanted to invite in some preachers who would bless us. Last night on Saturday, we welcomed Pastor Bill Lamar from Metropolitan AME Church this morning, Dean Bernard Richardson from Rankin Chapel. And today at this service, we are blessed uh, he's been with us before in our Bible studies, and today I'm proud to present him as the preacher he is. Some of you all know him as the professor of sociology at Georgetown University. You are always prone to turn on the television and see him giving a critique in a humorous way that cuts deep. Dr. Dr. Dyson has a gift. He has a way of cutting folk, and they don't know they were cut till they left, and they start bleeding afterwards. And then they realize, oh my gosh, he just cut my whole philosophy down. He is an amazing brother in Christ. I love him like a big brother. And more importantly, he is a member of the Alfred Street Baptist Church. And we are proud to claim him. He is our preacher for this morning. Would you help welcome for the first time on a Sunday morning, the Reverend Dr. Michael Eric Dyson, our preacher for this Sunday morning. Bless you, man. Bless you. We are excited for God to use him to bless our lives. We thank you, O oh God, for the magnificence of this hour, for the sweetness of this service, and for your grace and mercy. We thank you for yet another opportunity to come to your house. and tell the truth about your great and matchless mercy toward us. We thank you for the man of God you have placed in this midst. Continue to strengthen him and give him vision and vigor to realize your particular will and way. Now there is no word in my tongue that thou dost not know altogether so may the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. Amen. Amen. To the Reverend Doctor, Professor, Pastor, <laughs> Homeboy Extraordinaire, <laughs> the Reverend Doctor Howard John Wesley one of the greatest servants of God in this nation today. And to all of the other extraordinary dignitaries, and of course, Dr. Williams and this great church, this great choir, all of you, the members, the officers, it's just great to be in my church yeah. on Sunday morning. I'm on the road so often. Uh, on the weekends, and it is an honor and a privilege whenever I get a chance to come back to my church, because I ain't joined many churches in my life. I am a corrupted Negro intellectual, <laughs> and we are incorrigible, like herding cats. If it was dependent upon Negro intellectuals to save the world, we would not be saved because we can't agree on nothing. <laughs> but what we seem to agree with, Dr. Williams, with her brilliance, myself and others who come to this church, is that we have here an extraordinary convergence. A man who is at once a preacher and a Christian. <laughs> I'm just telling you what I know. I'm just telling you what I know. And to have this man of God here. And I'm going to tell you, you know, like they say about the, about the rappers, he, he big in these streets. <laughs> he big in these streets. I travel all, I was just in Austin, Texas yesterday. I mean, I'm all over the country. And they always 
say, I heard you join Alfred Street Baptist Church. They're just as amazed that I joined a church <laughs> as they are by the fact that I'm hanging out with this extraordinary man of God. And that's a heck of a combination to have the ability to appeal to young people, to know the old traditions, to appeal to the ancient landmarks, and yet move us into the future. That's the kind of 21st century leader we have in this man. He only has a very few flaws. <laughs> I prefer the Native Americans to the, um, to the uh, I guess the cowboys. But what's interesting, <laughs> but y'all got a great quarterback this year. But, uh, but let's give it up for our pastor, our leader, our visionary, the Reverend Dr. Howard John Wesley. Yes, sir. And hanging out with my man Gilbert Campbell, who's a member of the church as well, so he gives me a ride over here. Uh, a tremendous young businessman and entrepreneur and his father, Dr. Gilbert Campbell, uh, the former pastor of New Calvary Baptist Church in Richmond. I want them to stand so you can see them right quick. Tremendous uh, duo there, <laughs> Mr. and Dr. Campbell. <clears throat> now this morning, I want to turn your attention uh, to, to a newly renamed book of the Bible, 1 Corinthians. <laughs> and in 1 Corinthians, the 14th chapter and the 6th down through the 12th verses, you'll discover these words Corinthians 14, 6 through 12. And I'll read from the New International Version. Now, brothers and sisters, if I come to you and speak in tongues, what good will I be to you unless I bring you some revelation or knowledge or prophecy or word of instruction? Even in the case of lifeless things that make sounds, such as the pipe or harp, how will anyone know what tune is being played unless there is a distinction in the notes? Again, if the trumpet does not sound a clear call, who will get ready for battle? So it is with you, unless you speak intelligible words with your tongue, how will anyone know what you are saying? You will just be speaking into the air. Undoubtedly, there are all sorts of languages in the world, yet none of them is without meaning. If then I do not grasp the meaning of what someone is saying, I am a foreigner to the speaker, and the speaker is a foreigner to me. So it is with you. Since you are eager for gifts of the Spirit, try to excel in those that build up the church. And then I want to just turn to another uh, passage in 1 Corinthians, the 15th and 52nd verse, and there you'll discover these words. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound and the dead shall be raised incorruptible and we shall be changed. You may be seated. May the Lord add a blessing to the hearing and reading of the word. I want to preach very briefly this morning on the subject waiting for the real trump. I offer a warning, any resemblance to real life is entirely coincidental. <laughs> I, I'm just preaching out the word this morning. In, in this first particular passage of the Bible, it's well known to you, Paul is engaging in a broad-ranging conversation about the nature of the gifts of the church. 
And there is an especially acute sensitivity around the issue of the gift of tongues. And Paul doesn't want to diss the church because that gift of tongues is critical, but it's been exaggerated. The meaning and significance of those tongues has been elevated to an artificially high position. And as a result of that, what is intended as a good thing ends up being a bad thing. Now, we know about that, the gifts we possess, the things that we have, the talents that God has given to us, sometimes get so elevated that they get distorted. And when they get distorted, they are outside of the perimeter of their application, and therefore, through misapplication, the gift becomes a scourge, becomes a burden. And so Paul is trying to, to make an argument about the tension between piety and prophecy. Because, because piety is critical. It is about the personal relationship to God. It is about the decorum ethically and morally that people should have. It's about how they should treat each other and relate to one another. But, but most especially and problematically, sometimes piety becomes a showcase for the narcissism of one's own spiritual inclination. You just trying to show how good you is and how powerful you are and how much better you are than other people. The, 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 the grasp of piety in this nation has been ruinous because some have accentuated, highlighted, and underscored their personal relationship to God in a way that elevates them without humility in their own minds and exaggerates their own goodness. The word reminds us it ain't about your goodness in the end of the day anyway. It's about what God doing through you. You could be messed up, but when you get fessed up and you get churned around, something good can come through you. It ain't about you, it's through you. And so piety is critical, but it is a false god. Piety is, is necessary, but it is not, Paul says, prophecy. Paul says prophecy is better. Why? Because prophecy edifies the entire body of the church. You, your piety elevates you. Look how good you are. Look how well you speak. Look how great you preach. Look how wonderfully you sing. But prophecy is for the whole church. Paul says it edifies the entire body. Everybody gets in on the act of prophecy because prophecy is not simply about foretelling what's going to come. It's about helping to participate in the action that will facilitate the prophecy that you're speaking about. In other words, there is an intimate association and critical link between prophecy and participation. The best way, they say, to foretell the future is to get involved with it. The best way to predict stuff that's going to happen is for you to participate. Say, for instance, something was going to happen on a day of next week. Let's just say Tuesday. <laughs> Ain't no good for you to sit around prophesying what's going to happen. Amen. You asking people what they going to do, what you going to do. You, you can prophesy about what may be the potential outcome of a bitter battle, but unless you participate, if you get so involved with your righteous piety, if you get so involved in your racial piety that you say, uh, this ain't what we had before and I'm not excited about this particular thing, it ain't about your excitement. Right? Everybody that makes you jump high ain't holy. You can get excited about a whole bunch of stuff that ain't got nothing to do with God. It ain't about who excites you. You, you ought to learn that lesson in your own life. Oh, she might break the horizon of your sight with an infinitesimal amount of erotic glory, but it, it might excite you, but it won't feed you. Won't get up and, and take care of your kids. Won't set the table 
for an intellectual banquet for you to be able to engage in a serious acknowledgement of God's presence through cerebral activity. Everything that excites you can't feed you. So Paul is saying that prophecy is critical because piety is a narcissistic engagement with your spiritual gift, but prophecy helps the whole congregation. But then he hones in on this notion of tongues because a lot of us understand that tongues are, are beautiful and powerful. People, Paul says, ain't nobody out tonguing me. I speak in more tongues than all of y'all, unknown and known. Right? He could break it down. And so he says, but if you don't understand what I'm saying, what good is the tongue? He said, the tongue must be accompanied by interpretation. And interpretation is critical because a lot of folk know the words on the page, but they don't know the meaning behind the words. You got to look at context. You got to look at when it was said. You got to look at what they was aiming for. You got to look at the meaning, significance of the particular passage and how it relates to other stuff. You got to look at the genre. Is it poetry? Is it philosophy? Is it history? You got to know what you're talking about. You can't just say words on a page. You can't quote philosophical ideas without understanding their predicate. You, you got to understand the context. When I listen to the great philosopher Christopher Wallace, you, you got to understand what the words is. Back in the days, our parents used to take care of us. Look at them now. They're even scared of us calling the city for help because they can't maintain. Darn things done changed. That's clear. So is, I used to fuss when the landlord dissed us. No heat. Wondered why Christmas missed the birthdays was the... Now we sip champagne when we... Darn right, I like the life I live. Because I went from... And if you don't know, now you know. Now, I ain't mad at no contemporary philosophers, but what y'all be saying? The Muslims have come, 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 what? I'm gonna need some interpretation on future. Paul says that. It is the sound that makes a difference. Then he hones in on it's not the intelligibility predicated upon rationality. It's how the sound itself gives us a sense of the meaning. Oh, he's in our wheelhouse now. Because you see, in the history of Western philosophy, sight within dominant European culture has been the means by which they talk about knowledge. Descartes. Immanuel Kant, they were talking about the mind as a mirror of nature. But for black folk, knowledge came differently. It came through sound. That's why they outlawed the drum in New Orleans in Congo Square. Because Negroes were speaking to each other without words. Just the sound itself conjured something more potentially liberating than a particular communication that was based upon rational expression. It ain't that we was against it, we just understood it could be heard by the other side, so we got to communicate in a way that only we know what we saying. That's why we love the sound of James Brown. We ain't always understood what he was saying. <laughs> have it, have it, do have it, ha! But when he hit that one, we understood what he was saying. We, we understood what he meant. So the drum became the instrument of expression and communication. And rational discourse was critical, but even more profound was the ability of us to communicate with one another. And so the Bible says that, that how you gonna know even what battle you in unless the trumpet sounds a particular sound. 
Louis Armstrong had a trumpet. We could tell the difference because when everybody else sounded tinny, back in the 1920s and 30s, he had an ornate and beautiful sound. We knew the sound of Miles Davis and John Coltrane in 1959, kind of blue. When that horn became a measure of bending notes and Coltrane shrieked, and the grief and complaint of black existence found its expression and articulation in bebop and then cool music because we were rebelling against the appropriation by dominant white culture of swing music. We wanted to do something that only we could do and only we could play, so we had to communicate in a different idiom. The sound was critical. The Bible says you could be a lifeless thing making noise. And that's why we don't know what the battle is. The Bible presupposes there's a battle going on, and you and I know there's one going on. Yes. The future of this nation is at stake. Yes. There's a battle going on out there, y'all. And so some of them are playing sounds that are hostile to the emphasis that we have strategically and historically embraced. We ain't got to demonize nobody else. You're just sounding crazy. Yes. You, you, James Brown said, you're like a dull knife. Just ain't cutting. You're talking loud. And so here we are in that battle now. And folk trying to act like they don't know where that sound came from. Hating on Mexicans. Hating on gays and lesbians. Hating on African American and Latino. Hating on everybody that ain't you. Whiteness has had its day, but it's been over for the last seven and a half years. Yeah, just, just tell them why you're mad, son. <laughs> tell them why you're mad. That sound of hate came because another figure that God had invested in came along. Yeah. You thought you knew who was going to be running stuff. Yeah. But a Negro with some swag from the south side of Chicago yeah. stepped up into the spot and said, yes, we can. And, and, and expressed his vision and value and you didn't know where he was coming from because he was making a sound that God Almighty had blessed him with. Yes. Now there are sounds being made, bigotry, hatred. Y'all trying to act like y'all don't know where that sound came from. Some people in your own party acting like where he, you made him, you created him. The poop in that diaper came from what you fed him. He playing an instrument you think is wrong. Remember, Frankenstein is the name of the doctor, not the monster. Now you done created that monster. Now he trying to destroy you. That's your baby. He playing the song you gave him. You didn't mind when he said one guy wasn't a real American citizen. You didn't mind when he said, show me your birth certificate. You didn't mind when he was attacking a manifestly superior, cerebrally acute intellectual. You didn't get mad at that. But when he turned his instrument against you, when he started beating up on the very people who gave him life, then it became a problem. Oh, but we already knew. We've been in this battle too long. We done seen what these people be like. Oh, whiteness has come to an end. We ain't dogging you. But the hegemony and dominance and preponderance of whiteness has to be challenged. You can't just show up and expect to blow up. You got to do like Negroes. You got to prove yourself. We got to be twice as good just to get in the dough. We get our lesson early. We know the sound. He been playing in your band all these years when you've been telling people that people of color are problematic. When you've been saying poor black people are the problem. When you've been talking about black on black crime. It is true that 93% of black people who are killed are killed by black people. But 84% of white people who are killed are killed by white people. People kill where they live. If you want integrated killing, have integrated communities. (laughs) 
This battle been going on. We have a battle between that which is right and that which is wrong. And how do we know? Piety celebrates itself, but prophecy celebrates the community. You trying to build walls with what? The very people you hating on going to have to build them. You know the Mexicans going to have to build a wall, but you dogging the Mexicans. You dogging the poor black people, the poor black people who work for no wages for 250 and 300 years up in this place. You ought to be giving us workman comp for the next century and a half. My brothers and sisters, Paul says, if the trumpet doesn't sound in a way that's intelligible, how you gonna know to go to battle? The reason we know to go to battle is because we've worked with a God who has taught us that regardless of what goes on out there, we got some things we can do. You and I must be in tune to the maker of the instrument. The reason you know how to master the clarinet or the saxophone is because you know who made it. And those of us who are intimately associated with our God know that our God will save us and see us through regardless of the outcome. Yeah. Or as the brothers say, irregardless. Yeah. That, don't mean, <laughs> that don't mean you ain't got to get out there and do your part. That don't mean you ain't got to stand up. You've got to be the instrument of God yourself. If God fine-tunes you, then you have to speak the truth. It ain't always going to win your new friends. Some of your white folk might not be too happy with you, but in the long run, the God you love will tell the truth through you. That's what we got to do. If they don't like the man that's running things now, ain't a Negro been made they going to ever dig. He nice what he is. He's sweet. He has a great disposition. That ain't everybody. That ain't the rest of us. We need to let them know, no, that ain't how it go now. That's him. He been in public housing for seven and a half years. That's beautiful. There's some other Negroes in public housing ain't like that. They ain't nice with it. We're not going to mollycoddle you and make you innocent. Grow up. Be accountable for what you do. Be accountable for the monster you have created. That's your child. That's your daddy. That's your cousin. That's your uncle. That's your instrument. Then I'm glad because I'm waiting for the real sound. I'm waiting for the real trump to sound. And that trump sounds the, the note of life. Bible tells us that in that day, the incorruptible shall put on itself and mortality shall give away to immortality. That's the trump I'm waiting on. The trumpet that sounds love and peace and sacrifice and goodness. That's the trump you and I should be waiting on. The trump that says we love each other. We will support each other. We will take care of each other. We will not allow the negativity to prevail. So on Tuesday, let the real trump sound. 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 On Wednesday, let it sound. Let it sound.